Fede, do, do you remember what Paolo told us last time? Yeah, something about empathy, maybe? Yeah, yes, yeah, I was, I was thinking of... You got nice nightmares about empathy? Not nightmares and not sweet dreams, just thoughts. What's your definition of empathy? Oh, I don't have my definition of empathy, of course. Uh, I can read you one uh, that I can get online. So one full definition that I found is empathy is the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another of either the past or present without having the feelings, thoughts, and experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. Uh, I think now I already fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> so, for whoever didn't have this clear, uh, I believe that empathy is just that uh, sort of approach in trying to get into someone's shoes. I think, yeah, it's, it's easier to translate in what you said, and uh, I, I strongly believe that it's really, really more than just understanding, because I feel empathy for you, it's not just, oh, I feel you. It's, it's something really powerful, and as Paolo told to us, it's not just a, about a design concern. Every works, every, every man should feel empathy at some point. And I would say the more empathy you are able to feel, the more happier your life will be. When I can feel more empathy with everyone, I'm really happy with the life I'm living, because I have more happiness in return. That's very true. I believe the reason why we probably want to talk about this as a separate topic today is it's because being empathic, empathetic, it's uh, the key not only for a, be a more successful designer, but even a better human being. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, true. I believe that in design, the most important part would be understand the behavior of change, right? So it's... It, it, when I start feeling with my with, with the people I'm interacting to when I'm doing my research or when I want to discover and get in deep or a little bit more, I always should include the emotional states of, of people, of persons. Because we are talking with people. We are not we're not talking with machines, right? So how I can how I can design as a designer a solution to someone without including their emotional states. That is beyond context and like pain points. Well, I believe that you go through the, to some extent, the five senses. You will you like, like in an ideal world, you will like to get into, into the, the person's body and mind and, and stomach, or something, mm. right? Because you want to be able to feel what they feel. You want to be able to see what they see. You want to even be able to smell mm. what they smell, depending on the experience, right? Or, or taste what they taste. Like the, That's why I mentioned the five senses. Uh, to some extent, that's mm. what I mean by being in their shoes. There is a combination of activities and tasks that a person does whenever it's uh, going through an experience. And that goes then beyond when you connect to the, to the, to the five senses and, and what they're experiencing. And again, there is something that you might not see translated in an action by that goes through the person's mind. And you, as much as you can try to be empathetic with it, then you can try to relate uh, and understand what's going through. What's going through. Uh, I don't think we have any any specific, uh, you know, fantastic scientific tool to get there. Right. So no canvas, no, 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 no tricky stuff. Well, uh, Elon Musk just released something very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Neural chips and and we can we can invite him if you want if you agree with that. Well, it looks like we're beginning the Black Mirror uh, era. Uh, I don't know if you guys have followed ah, right. the show Black Mirror, but it's uh, pretty much everything starts from that chip installed in uh, in the human brain. Many of those uh, episodes, that, by the way, are phenomenal mm. in my opinion, but also very extreme. But without getting into a rabbit hole here, uh, we were just saying that we can start just by being good listeners. That would be the very good yeah. step. As, as, as a tip to develop empathy, to being more aware of your, um, um, or more aware of your state of empathy, of how you can develop this better attitude. Because if you are not feeling this state of empathy, you can develop it. You can, you can start growing with it, with it. So yeah, you can start definitely listen more, be more humble because empathy is, with, 
I think in my case started from don't have like misconceptions or bad feelings on people that you don't know or judge them before. I like to be practical. Something that you said, I would say that one of the tools that I've been seeing used the most uh, when it comes to be uh, empathetic with a with our audience, with the people you want to serve for. One of the tools that I've seen using a lot is this concept of the day in the life. And again, for the people that are not familiar with the concept is every time that you go through like a pitch, and if you look something like Shark Tank, you'd see it all the time. It's probably the very beginning of every storytelling. So the first part is put yourself into your user shoes or your people shoes. And you will see this story or can be a video, but basically something where we tell the story of a person that goes through a journey, usually is their current state. So all the pain and the issues they have, like, I don't know, they might have like a shirt that doesn't fit uh, or a tool that they can't use because, the, because they're lefty, it can be a plethora of things. And then all of a sudden, there is the reveal of the big reveal of the tool or the solution or the product, whatever you're doing, and then the day in the life turns into this future state. And now they will be able to do things uh, or experience things in a the way that they couldn't do before. So this day in the life, whether you do the complete before and after, is something that is very, very popular today. But I would say without going into the second part, the first part is a very powerful exercise because it makes you think of what they are experiencing. To some extent, I've been doing a number of those uh, day in the life, uh, especially when I was working in consulting. And when you ask your client, do you realize what your users are feeling, what your people are feeling? You can ask them to do a sort of a, like a sketch, right? Uh, they putting themselves in their shoes. Uh, it al almost becomes comical because it's so extreme uh, that they are saying, oh, I can't believe that this is true. You know, it looks like a movie. I can't believe that our users are really going through all through of this. So the day in the life is a fantastic exercise to develop empathy. What we call in a more UX design role, I've made this called that like a customer journey where we use like a, a la graph with a mood. So you can you can start seeing what the people's mood are is with with this graph that it's up and that it goes up and down. And you can see what why are they suffering? What is their problem? Can we relate with this problem too? Are we able to act on this problem to provide a solution? Because as, as we said, if we are not aware of what's the problem behind, behind what we are solving of, how we can design a solution. The thing that I would like to add to that is that the journey map is a fantastic tool when it comes mm -hmm. to the analytical approach of uh, the overall experience. Because anyone can look at it and immediately see, okay, these are the plus and the minus, these are the mood swings and everything that works uh, uh, and doesn't work across the journey. But the reason why I do love uh, the day in the life exercise, that is the translation of in-person emotional and feelings in, a, in an in-person context, or so even if you do it virtual, is that you are not just reading from a document you are impersonating those feelings and you're making them yours. So that is where aspect of design thinking are extremely powerful in changing the way the people we work with are relating to a problem. Because I believe designers do it much more often, uh, but I believe that when you, let's say if there's no COVID, when you can sit down in a room and you have a team of four or five people impersonate like the employees or impersonate the end user and really act like they are doing and going through the experience, I think the effect and the level of empathy that you get is so much higher than any other customer journey. It doesn't matter how well it's done, can get. You should not take anything for granted, right? So when you read a document, you could say, oh, I know this, is, this could be a problem like to make the queue at the supermarket or to wait for your bank account to like taxes pay. This is not empathy. You're not developing empathy. You're not truly engage with the people's problem. Be curious to a lot of different things because you could not feel real empathy if you are not aware of why people are really suffering or are really taking care of something. So be curious, be open-minded and be comfortable in your uncomfort zone. There is something that like you shared with me that I will add to that, that is when you were talking about be ready to unlearn. 
I think that mm. unlearn is a very powerful exercise and an even powerful, much more powerful mindset. The concept of unlearn is that you always, as a human being, come with a, with a bias, with a bias that comes from your own experience, with your own ideas, with your role in a company or whatever you're doing. And in order for you to be really connected with the people, it's to unlearn everything you, you know. Basically, if you can go back and, uh, and, and be like a, I don't know, 16 year old kid, then you might be very, very ready to be empathetic with those people because you don't carry any bias. So unlearn is a powerful, powerful uh, way of doing that. Another uh, life moment that I had, there was an exercise we used to do still in those like on a design thinking session where all of a sudden we were asking um, our teams once they had an idea, so it was a little, a little bit along on the, on the solutioning. They already had a plan on how to organize and, and sell, almost pitch the idea. We had them pitch to 11-year-old kids. And it was phenomenal because they had to completely rethink all that bias and all the jargon and all the way you express yourself in order to, again, unlearn what they had and be empathetic with those new stakeholders that are in front of them. And the way you had to deliver your speech and your pitch, so the value exchange that you want to establish is completely different. You cannot use like buzzword or BS or anything that you lose like many times in the, in the company jargon because you're speaking with someone that goes straight to the point and they will either fall asleep or, or get in bored or tell you, I don't know what you're saying in your face. And believe me, it's probably the best exercise I've ever done. It's always a surprise and you have no idea how much people need to unlearn and learn uh, from that. This is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this. Let's say that we focused a lot on moving forward, but don't think that takes a step back. It's easier. Balance your, your journey between move forward and step back sometime. The journey itself, it's a uh... It's agile in nature. We said, we said that many times. If you go through iteration, you know you have to do it again. So be prepared uh -huh. to do that because if you want to do it right, I think Paolo said, many, said at the end of our interviews, uh, the best way to get good at that is just to fail. Because then you fail a couple of times and then you get better. I appreciate a lot our work in the podcast in Designers because I'm moving forward. I'm... I'm getting in touch with new conversation in a new way, in a new engaged way. But at the same time, I'm aware when I'm, at, when I'm relating to other people of the person I was and the one that I'm becoming, thanks to you and thanks to the amazing life stories that we are sharing with our guests. It's something unbelievable. I, I wasn't the same person that I am. I'm building more empathy with this, to listening and to interviews. Sometimes you need to take one step, one step back to make two steps forward. So yeah, that's, that's, cool. the, that's, that's the part of, of the training. The other thing is that sometimes it's not a step back. Like you, need, you don't need to redo, you just need to become more empathetic. You need to take a step on the side. So just let me give another example. Let me use you as, a, as an example. Like you've been yeah. doing your podcast and you'll be learning how to be more empathetic already, right? Uh, in a in certain way. But now you have to do mm. it again, this time in English. So mm. it, it's not, you are kind of repeating something you're doing already and you know the drill, but just because this time is not in your mother tongue, in your mother language, and there's something that it's out of the comfort zone again. So you need mm. to make yourself ready and able to listen, be able to understand everything and then express yourself. The reason why I wanted to do this example is that, yes, the step back, it's very, very interesting and very, very uh, important in, uh, in, in getting ready and then sprint. But sometimes you don't have to. Even a step on the side can be as good and as difficult to do. Like today, we decided to switch the cameras. And today I'm right. on the side, you're on the other one. See, all is changing. You'll never know <laughs> what's coming next. You will never so know. For today, I think that's everything. I hope that was yes. a, a cool, interesting topic. Let us know. Uh, send yeah, us absolutely. like or dislikes because that will be empathy as well. We'll we we'll learn from absolutely. anything, and I'll see you guys soon, very soon. Ciao, ciao, Rafa. Ciao.